And um, for the rest of us, welcome. Um, done things a little bit different this morning. Uh, we're starting to get our deacons involved, and hopefully uh, this week, uh, or thereabouts, you should be getting a little card or something from your deacon introducing himself to you, let him know that, that that's your deacon. Um, so uh, we're proud of these guys that you all have uh, appointed to be deacons, and so they're starting to do some work, and we're proud of them for doing that. Uh, also, we got one other announcement. Willie, what? tell us your announcement. So on May 18th, we asked Kevin if we could use the church for a baby shower for a simple child. Uh, everybody's welcome to come. Don't feel obligated, but it'll be May 18th here at 1 o'clock. May 18th at 1 o'clock. If anybody wants to come out to a wedding shower, uh, that is here at the church. May the... What did I say? Wedding. Oh. <laughs> it's a sign from God. There you go. Just do them both at one time. Get it over with. If you have your Bible, stand with me, you would please, for the reading of God's Word. Find the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Many folks will claim this passage of Scripture is one of their favorites in all of the Bible. You will know it as the love chapter. And uh, it is 1 Corinthians chapter 13. I'm reading from a teacher from the New American Standard. If you have King James or a different translation, the wording will be just a little bit different, but we'll all end up in the same place together. The word is on the screen. 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through 13. If I speak with tongues of men and angels, but have not... Okay, now we're all going to work here together, right? Here we go. Let's try it again. If I speak with tongues of men and angels, but do not have... I become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and all the mysteries... Uh, of the knowledge and if I have faith so as to remove mountains but have not Love. I am what? Nice. And if I give all my possessions to feed the poor and if I surrender my body to be uh, burned but do not have Love. it profits me what? Nice. Love is what? Nice. Love is nice. Love is nice. Love does not nice. is not nice. does not does not seek its, is not, does not take into account a wrong, does not rejoice in, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things. Love what? Love. Love. So verse uh, First Corinthians thirteen eight says uh, says love never what. But if there are gifts of prophecy, they'll be done away with, and there's tongues, they will cease. If there is knowledge, it will be done away. For we know in part and prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, uh, the partial will be done away with. When I was a child, I used to I speak and act like a child uh, and reason like a child. <coughs> when I became a man, I put away foolish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly, then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I will know fully just as I have been fully known. But now faith, hope, and what? Uh, abides these three. But the greatest of these three is what? Uh, let's pray together. Father, speak to our hearts this morning. Let us hear your voice today and let us hear your voice alone. Let's be obedient to your message this morning. If you're speaking on our hearts, Father. We pray that you speak to us clearly. And we ask it in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. you may be seated. <laughs> marriage, <clears throat> marriage is a dream, or love is a dream, and marriage is the alarm clock. <laughs> 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 talk about for the next several weeks the five pillars of successful relationships particularly dealing with marriage but any type of relationship boyfriend girlfriend husband and wife or even your fellow man how you deal with people now i'm going to be honest with you for the next few weeks we're going to, we're going to talk honest and we're going to talk i'm going to talk uh, uh 
boldly and straight to you, and I, I don't aim to offend you, but if, it, if something offends you, then uh, that's something you probably need to look in the mirror about and talk with God over. But I'm going to be honest about some things, and we're going to talk about some things in relationships and how we can make our relationships better. Now, why is that even important to do that? Because uh, statistically, 50% of all marriages end in divorce. 50%. And in the church, that number used to be really low, but in the church now, the statistics are just about the same as out in the world, 50% are in, in going higher every year. Most people get into marriage, and they don't, they, don't want, they don't go into marriage with the idea that, hey, if this don't work out, we'll just get a divorce. I don't think most people go into it with that idea, and sometimes those type of things do happen. You go through divorce, but not because you wanted to or because that was your goal in life. Is to say, hey, I'm going to get married, and in five years, be divorced. That's never anybody's goal, but stuff happens. Stuff happens in a period of time over a relationship because you change and they change. And if you don't change together, then what ends up happening, as you get older, you begin to pull apart and go into a different direction. You become a, a at, at 18, you're not the same person you're going to be at 48. You're going to have a lot of growing going on. And if you don't do that growing together, then marriages are struggle. And if we don't have a foundation upon which we build our marriages, something solid, when difficult times come and when trials come and when problems come, it's easy to just throw up our hands and give up and quit. It's easy. Some of y'all have been through it, but you've, you've gone through a divorce and you've gone through that, that pain and that suffering of, of having made a commitment at one point and looking at each other and saying, oh, we love each other, we want to we wanna spend the rest of our lives together to going through something happened that... You grew apart or, or things happened. There was infidelity. There was, uh, you know, all kinds of different things lead to it. But yet here you are and, and you've gone through it. You know that pain. And obviously, you don't want to ever repeat that again, right? So what makes a successful relationship? What makes a successful marriage? What makes us as people successful in being the kind of people that God is honored by? Because listen, in that relationship, that's what God wants out of us bigger than anything is that we honor Him and how we live our lives. And so marriage is an amazing relationship in which uh, each couple says uh, to the other, you see me, warts and all, flaws and all, this is who I am, and I want you to love me for the rest of my life. It's true that marriage is no guarantee that it's going to work forever or, or happiness is going to last forever. Quite honestly, the institution of marriage is in trouble in America. And following, our, and we think about the institution, we think also about the Christian institution of marriage. Marriage is a house that is in danger of being washed away unless it's built on some pretty heavy pillars. And I'm going to give you over the next five weeks five pillars, and then at the end of the five weeks, the sixth sermon, unless God changes my, my direction, that sixth sermon will be talking about the, the thing that no preacher wants to talk about in church, let alone in a closet uh, with a gun holding the door. By the, they don't want to talk about that three-letter word, but it's a vital, important word. Why would we talk about the word sex in church? Because they're talking about it in every classroom from the from grade school on up out in our world, and they're teaching them the secular view of it. We need to start talking about the biblical view of that three-letter word. We've stuck our head in the sand and tried to pretend that it, you know, we, well, we don't want to, you know, that's rude, crude, and undefined. We don't want to talk like that in here. While our children are led down a path by secular humanists who don't care about the, the direction your children go. They don't care about the future of your children. They'll t they want to teach them the world's way of everything. And then we wonder why the world's so messed up. Because the pulpit has been silent about how to live and make basic relationships happen. We've been silent about that three-letter word because we didn't want to get involved in that topic. Well, listen, ladies and gentlemen, it's time we start talking about the things that really matter. It's time we start pushing back against the world's uh, view, viewpoint of what things are. It's time we start talking about how we as Christians can be productive in a world that is so anti-God. And the first thing we're going to talk about this morning is the first pillar to build your life upon, relationships, 
uh, marriage, anything you build your life on has to be, the first pillar has to be love. The first pillar has to be love. 1 Corinthians 13 defines love for us, right? And so we think about, let's think about relationships for just a minute. A, a, a boy meets a girl and a girl meets a boy and they look at each other and the girl says, well, he's so cute. And the guy looks at the girl and says, wow, she's hot. Now, before we go any farther, let's stop here for just a minute so that we understand this. Men and women think different. So y'all already know that, right? We think different. Men operate out of um, left brain logic. They're more logical. They work out of the left side of their brain. Women work out of the right side of their brain. And on the right side of your brain deals with all your emotions. So, men, I'm just going to give you some things here at the beginning of this. When you're a woman, I want everybody to listen to me. Men, listen to, what, listen to me real carefully so that you understand this. When your woman comes to you and says, I need you to spend more time with me. I need you to, to come and, and, and be with me and... Put all your buddies to the side. Come to the house. Spend time with me. What she is saying is that she wants to be uh, cuddled. She wants to be held. She wants to watch a movie with you. Men, when they hear that from their woman and says, hey, I want to spend time with you. I want to be with you. Their, their mind immediately goes to that three-letter word. And so he comes home early from work and he takes a shower, maybe the first one in a week, and he <laughs> takes a shower and he, he puts on his favorite cologne and he looks in the mirror as he flares his hair back and thinks, man, I'm a catch. Man, she's lucky to have me. And he beats his chest like Tarzan and says, oh, everything's going to be all right. And he, and he models himself, walks himself right into the room. She's on the couch in her pajamas or her baggy sweats, hair pulled back in a bun, look like she hadn't had makeup on in six weeks. Because she's not interested in sexual relations, she's interested in spending time with you. When she says she wants to spend time with you, that is literally what she means. She wants to spend time with you. And now if you take it and say, hey, I know what she know. You're off balance, bud. You're going to be set up for disappointment. And then the, then the reaction you're going to get back from her is, that's all you want is my body. And then the man gets frustrated because he come into this situation with the wrong expectations. Now, it doesn't mean that relationships can't lead to that at some point. Okay. But men, you can't think that way. If that's all you're thinking about, you're going to be disappointed at some point, right? She wants you to spend time with her. She wants you to cuddle her. She wants you to, to just hold her hand. To you know, how in the world y'all think Conway Twitty had sixty number one hits? Because he he taught he hit all his songs were sweet nothings. Hello, darling. Nice to see you. Right. Been a long time. <laughs> Conway Twitty sang a song and he, he give you men the formula. I lay you down and softly whisper pretty love words in your ears. I lay you down and tell you all the things a woman loves to hear. I'll let you know how much it means just having you around. Now, now he didn't get to the laying down part. <laughs> Until he whispered pretty love words in her ears. <laughs> Men in the left brain thinking they're going straight for the goal. The door is here. We're going straight to the door. Women don't work that way. Women will go, if they're going out the door, they'll look down the aisles and see if there's trash and needs to be picked up and all that stuff. We think different. And so, gentlemen, especially you young guys, listen, spend time. When you get older, how many of you older men can attest that? When you get older, you appreciate your time together. You don't have to be doing anything that involves taking your clothes off 
As you get older, you realize time is so precious. And it's just nice to be around and be there having a person who's more than just your lover. She's your friend. She's somebody that you can tell all your problems to. She's the deepest secrets of your heart. You can tell her that. You can be with her and, and take a ride. And Pam and I are at the age and stage of our lives that we can go and we can ride for three hours and never say a word and be satisfied just because we're in the car together. Now, it took me some time to get there, right? But, I, but as we mature, we have to understand that, that love is, is, uh, is more than just sexual relation. That's lust. L-U-S-T. And lust, after a while, this is why many marriages are, are not successful. Because a relationship starts out, and if it starts out strictly on lust, strictly on the physical... And you have no other connection. You don't, you don't take time to, to know each other, to be friends, to share with each other, to talk with each other, to listen to each other. Eventually, when the lust wears off, and it will, you wake up one day and you look at a person, who is this? I don't, I don't know. I don't know who they are. I don't know what they like. I don't know their dreams. And then you look and eventually you say, well, you know what? I don't, really don't like what they stand for. I don't like their dreams. I don't like their, their thoughts. I don't like their hopes. And it all started because we're young and we're not in love. We're in lust. Now, love, so let's understand what love is. The Bible, the Bible gives us the ideal of love. Go, go to Next slide there for me, if you would. Next one. Verse 4. Now look at what love is. He lays it out pretty clearly to us. Love is what? Okay. Men, because I'm going to talk to you today. Men, if you're a man in a room, say amen. amen. Uh, Y'all need a testosterone shot. <laughs> If y'all are men in the room, say amen. amen. Love is what? First one, love is... Are you patient with your spouse? Or do you blow up at the drop of a hat? A young man will blow up at the drop of a hat because I'm convinced of this in life. Most young men don't really hit their maturity stride until they're about 26, 27, 28 years old. About that age, they start coming around and really developing in who, in who, they, who they need to be and who they eventually will be. But young men, most young men have anger issues. Now, I think the reason why we have anger issues is this, is that we grow up as young men telling our young babies, our young boys, to not do one thing, and that's what? Don't cry. Right? Don't cry. You're a big boy. Little, girl, little girls do all the crying. Boys don't do that. And so when you do that to a young man, you develop a young man who doesn't know how to process his emotions. He knows that he's angry. He knows he's frustrated. He knows he's aggravated. And stuff inside of him is going crazy. And about the time he turns about 13 or 14 years old, testosterone kicks in. And testosterone just is not the, uh, a sexual component. Testosterone, the surge of testosterone makes a young man, uh, he's growing muscles, he's, growing, he's having all these changes going on in his body. And one of the things is anger he deals with. It's because of all this rage of testosterone coming in him and he deals with anger. Now he knows he's been told his whole life that young boys don't cry. And so he, he's got all this emotion in him. And he's trying to get it out of him, but he knows he can't cry. So most of the time for all of us young men, our emotions come out in bursts of anger. Now, all of us men, if we're honest, we were there at one time. I will be the first to tell you, I broke more remote controls and uh, punched more holes in walls. And I had the Hulk Hogan tear your shirt off poles down to a science. Man, I had more buttons flipping around the house than anything in the world. Pam would ask me one question, and I would fly off the handle. Rip my shirt like Hulk Hogan. <laughs> Who you ask me that for? Love is patient. Okay? Now, lady, let me say this to you. You're a lady in the room? Let me hear you say amen. amen. See how much bolder they are than you guys this morning? Lady, listen to me. I want every lady to listen to me. 
You were created in the image of God. He created you with a purpose. He created you on purpose with a plan for a future for your life. You deserve nothing less than total respect from a man. And if he can't give it to you, I don't care how cute he is, how hot he is, how much bodybuilding he does, or how many dollars he's got in the bank. If he doesn't respect you, get away. Because <clears throat> what happens is when women put up with angry, angry men, and that's where we get abuse. And women get, get beat up and beat on and, and all kinds of things happen. And some of y'all may be in here today and have been products of that in your past. That, uh, and maybe you might be going through it today that your significant other, your boyfriend or your husband are, is beating on you when he gets angry or pushing you around when he's getting angry. Now listen, I've got a daughter. And the thing I told my soon-to-be son-in-law was this. I didn't threaten him or any of that stuff. I said, when you get tired of her, bring her back home to me. I don't want you hit. Don't hit on her. Don't treat her bad. You don't have to do any of that. You can get out of this thing easy enough. Bring her back home to me. You know why? Because I'm not going to treat her that way. And if I'm not going to treat her that way, guess what I expect? I don't expect a man to treat my daughter any other way than the way I treat her. And ladies, you have every expectation in a relationship that the man, if he's got his hands on you, out the door, he should go, no questions asked. Well, I can change you. No, you can't. Can't nobody change nobody but the person who wants to change. Okay? Are we clear on that? Because I want you to understand, you have ever, you don't have to put up with this nonsense. And guy, if you're doing it, if you're beating on your girl or you're beating on your wife, then you need to look yourself in the mirror because you're really not a man. A man will never put his hands on a woman. Amen. God created her in Genesis to be a helpmate, not a punching bag. So love her. Love is patient. Love is what? If I'm, uh, if I'm kind, I, I'm going to treat her right. If you're kind to me, you're going to treat me right. Reciprocal here. Love is not, now this is, a, a, this is a great big one for some of you young folks in the room. Love is not what? Jealous. Oh, here we go. Jealous. Now how many of you older ladies can remember at one point when you were first dating your man that you had that jealous streak in you that you know what, that woman better not be talking to him. Uh, Eddie, Eddie, Eddie's dating Lisa and Lisa looks around the corner and sees Eddie talking to the cheerleader because uh, Eddie, Eddie was a ball player. They called him Fast Eddie because he could run. Now, now he used to be Fast Eddie. <laughs> Lisa looks around the corner and Eddie's talking to the cheerleader. They're dating, they're not married. She's looking, looking at the cheerleader. He just said, you know, it comes on that, you know, she's over just giving him down. What are you doing talking to her? What are you doing? Then you're sticking on the other. And that's what happens when you're younger. Unfortunately, fortunately, you should grow out of that stuff, right? Unfortunately, a lot of people never grow out of jealousy. And they live their whole relationships jealous or worried that your man's going to be doing this, that, and the other. Now, listen, it goes back to the whole thing. Men, listen to me. If you are in a relationship with a woman, cut off the social media, quit Snapchatting or whatever that stuff is you do. Somebody that, There's one that you can do that it disappears. Nobody can really know that you've done it. Quit doing that to another woman. Quit texting her. Quit calling her. Quit doing all that stuff. If you are in a committed relationship, you are committed to her. You're not committed to her and everybody else. And lady, if he's doing that and he's honoring you and he's he's committed to those things and he's he's doing right by you, then don't throw up in his face if somebody comes around the corner and says, Hey, hi, we used to go to high school together. How you doing? Tell a story. We, uh, I didn't learn this lesson until I was a little older. We'd been married, and I never got out of the country much. So we, we get married and moved to Lexington. We're going through the mall. You ever know if you want to go see strange things, strange people, all kind of, go to the mall, you'll find it, right? 
And so we were in the mall one day, and we hadn't been married probably six months, nine months, somewhere. It wasn't quite a year, I don't think. And we were shopping somewhere in one of the stores in the mall. And I was a young man, come by, walking by me with some half-dressed young women. And I wasn't paying attention to my wife. I was looking at these girls walking by. And my wife stopped on a dime. And I ran over her. <laughs> and ran her into the clothes rack. She fell deep into the clothes rack. All because I wasn't doing what I'm preaching to you now. Now, that probably didn't go over too well. But on the same token, she was jealous. So I dated a girl in high school. I don't know if you really want to call it dated or whatever. Girlfriend. You know how you, you, you got girlfriends and stuff? You know, uh, I, I had one in high school, uh, or middle school to early part of high school. And, and uh, when we got married, she actually lived in the apartment attached. The, the apartment, there's two apartment buildings attached to each other. And she was in the other building that was attached to ours. So in our unit, there was eight apartments in her unit there was eight apartments but in ours you open the door to go into the apartment so it's like a big breezeway right and the apartment doors upstairs and downstairs are inside you go in the door well the problem was is that when you open the front door the back door to the to this building would slam like that and so we live right above where we parked and every day i got home before pan i had a recliner sitting inside right beside the window and I would hear her pull up, and I would open the curtains and look over, and there she was getting out. She'd look up at me, and I'd look down at her, and she'd come get out of the car and open the door to the, to the entryway to our apartment, and that back door would go every time. And she got in her head and was convinced that and when I, I had that girl up in the apartment with us, and, and every time that she pulled up, I was looking and seeing and sending her down the back set of the steps, and that door slamming wasn't vacuum of the door the, of the entryway. It was a, my girl going out the other door back to her apartment. And we fought and we fought and we fought over that stuff. And we almost got a divorce. Because I was immature. And she was jealous. And those combinations do not work. Gentlemen, I have learned to understand this, that the woman God has given me is a gift from God. I am, I, I make a point in my life, that I've told her, you divorce me and take off with another man, and I'm going with both of you. I don't care where, you're not getting rid of me. You ought to look at the girl that you get, God's given you that way. And you ought to respect, lady, nothing but that back to you. And if you're in a relationship where you're not getting that back, then you need to rethink about the relationship that you're in. Because we talked about in Ephesians chapter 5. I want you to look at that with me up here on the screen. Ephesians chapter 5. Husbands, love your wife. How? How, how did Christ love the church? What's it say? So you're to love your wife enough that you're willing to die for her. Now let me ask you a question. We, we, we go back to that passage of Scripture. It says, well, I submit yourself to your husband. I'm, I'm gonna I keep going back to this. There's not a wife in the world that wouldn't submit to her husband if she was loved like this. If she knew that her husband was loved her enough that he would die for her. Now, man, here's the thing. We're talking about love. Love is not. Love is not physical all the time. Okay? Most men, that's what they think. Okay, well, I, well you know, I, uh, do, do you love me? Yeah, you, you know, I love, how do you know? You know, well, I, I, I said something. I said I loved you. You can say I love you all the time and not mean it. And they know it. You girls know when your man tells you that, well, I love you. You know when he's telling you a lie when he's when he's not. Love is when it's from the heart that that you're with somebody that you you know you can't live without. 
And love is, is there when the lust dies off. You ever heard the song by Jerry Reed? She got the gold mine, I got the shaft. You remember the lines in that song? The first thing they talked about how she got the gold mine? After a while, the lust died off. And it does for every relationship. And you better make sure you're in love, not in lust. Because after a while, the lust will die off. The man that you married right now, uh, Levi, is a fine-looking young man right now. He's in shape. He's all that. And in 30 years, he'll look completely different than what he does now. He might even have him a little pot belly. He might have lost all his hair like Jason. Will you still love me? What was the old song? Will you still love me? Will you still love me when I'm... Y'all heard it? I thought it was when I'm 69 or... Will you still love me? Will you still love me? Huh? The Beatles? It said what? When it was a Beatles song, yeah. You know, will you still love him when he's old and gray and no hair and fat? And, you know? Because that day's coming. You know, unless he's like John Galbraith, who's a powerful and attractive man, <laughs> who's managed to stay in shape and keep a figure and, you know, mine went to the wayside. She married She married me and 30 years later got three of me. Because you know. things do change, right? Again, I'm telling you, we're talking, this is serious talk about life the next few weeks. So if you came for just regular preaching, I'll get back to it in a few weeks. I want to talk about life these next few weeks because we need to talk about it. Love is, love is not about, you know, attractiveness is one thing, but you know what? There's a lot of pretty women, a lot of pretty women in the world. And you know what What I tell my son a lot about, uh, you know, oh, this one's hot and that one's hot. And I said, yeah, and there's somebody's tired of dealing with her somewhere. <laughs> Looks fade away. We grow old, we get different. Some of the most beautiful people in the world are the ones that the world don't think that they're nothing or nobody. See, the world says you've got to be a certain way, right? And so we're sold this bill of goods, and young people are sold this bill of goods. And it affects a lot of our young ladies today that the world says you've got to look a certain way. And the way the world says you've got to look is stick thin. And so a lot of young women struggle with anorexia and, and bulimia and all these things trying to fit into an image that you can't live up to. God made you the way he made you and that's okay. Quit trying to fit a mold and, and be acceptable to, to people that don't value your worth. We're all going to get older. We're all going to we're all going to gain some weight. Most of us, except John. Well, maybe you've gained a few weight, a few pounds, about five pounds over 50, 60 years. You know, that's a, got taller. But most of us all gain weight. We we look different now than we did a, a years ago. So quit letting the world tell you you got to fit into this mold or that mold. And that's why so many young women have uh, struggled with their image and their self-worth because they are believing that they got to look a certain way. And so many young guys disvalue the worth of a young lady simply because of the size of her body or the weight on her because the world's been told you know, that you got to date somebody that looks a certain way. Well, let's just be honest. Can I be honest about this? Most of the world will tell young men, don't fake, don't, don't, well, don't date a fat girl. And, and so the girl, the girl that's got weight on her thinks she's fat. And so she now spends the rest of her life trying to get to an image that is on a magazine somewhere. And the thing about that image on the magazine somewhere is most of the time that magazine image has been airbrushed and filtered and touched up. If you saw the woman without all that other stuff, you wouldn't even be able to recognize her. Quit worrying about what the world says about your image. 
You are who you are. Be, don't worry about the weight. Worry about the quality of person that you are. And if you are a quality person, you're going to attract somebody who will love you for you. Be a character person. A person who, whose yes means yes and no means no. Be a person who, who lives a life of, of a moral standard that I have my boundaries and I have a self-respect for myself. And I don't care what you say about me. You can call me whatever you want to call me. I'm okay with me. Amen. Young lady, you're in the room today and I want you to repeat this after me. I am who God created me to be. And I'm okay with that. And I want you to mean that. You're okay with that. You are who God created. Now, does that mean that, you know, we just sit around, we sit around in our chair, put up our hairs, and uh, every time our husband comes home, we have a green mask on our face and curlers in our hair, and we got Cheeto dust on us from head to toe because we've ate three bags of Cheetos since he's been gone. No, it doesn't mean that. You do take care of yourself, but quit living up to a standard that the world hasn't been able to obtain. If you knew what some of those girls went through to maintain that standard, why? Why? Why, why be over a toilet bowl throwing your guts up after you eat just to maintain some idea of a woman? Look at the standard of a woman 50, 60 years ago. Go back and look at some old pictures of the kind of women men married in the 1800s and the 1900s. It's a completely different image than today. See, the world's selling an image that's not attainable. It's not sustainable. And young women are literally losing their lives trying to get to a standard so some little punk boy somewhere will love you. And I'm going to say this and then I'm done. Ladies and gentlemen, before you ever worry about some little punk young boy or old punk man loving you, make sure first you love yourself. And make sure you understand that God loves you. And so when a guy walks by and says, well, I just, you know, you know, hey, I don't think I can talk to you because, you know, you got a little weight on you, honey. You're just not quite my type. Okay, that's fine. God loves me and he's got somebody out there for me. I didn't need you anyways. And when some girl comes along, young guy, and she, she doesn't love you for you, she loves you for the paycheck you can provide or the amount of money you got in your bank account, and you see a lot of, if you're on social media at all, you see a lot of videos on that, what's that thing y'all young people got now, top tick, 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 tock, tick, tack, toe. Y'all see a lot of young women on, the, on that thing that, that uh, what's these little experiments they do? A guy tries to get a girl and then he walks over to a really nice, she throws him off. I don't have nothing to do to you. Then he walks over to a really, really nice car and she, oh, that's your car? That's your Lamborghini? You know, well, hey, let's go. No, you don't need that either. She doesn't love you for you. Walk away. See, here's the thing about love. And, I, and I'm, 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 close. I'm done. We're, if you don't have the idea of what love is, you'll accept any kind of love. But the type of love that God has got is patient, it's kind, it's gentle. It's the kind of love that He puts you before everything else, and He's willing to die for you. He loves you that much. And if you're not getting that kind of love in a relationship, walk away from that. He said, well, preacher, I'm engaged to be married. But he's beating the tar out of me. I can't, I can't give up. No, give up. Walk away. You deserve better. If he's putting his hands on you, then get out of that. <laughs> the world's so messed up, folks. We're selling it. You're beautiful people. 
And God's created you the way He's created you. And the Bible says you've been created in the image of God. Quit letting people tell you you're not good enough. Quit letting people tell you that, that uh, you know, you're come from the wrong side of the tracks. Let people, quit letting people tell you you're nobody. Because I'm going to tell you this much. You believe me or you don't. But I'm going to tell you when you leave here today, I want you to know you are somebody. Because the greatest person to ever live on this planet, his name was Jesus Christ. He died at a cross at Calvary for you and for you alone. Now the world might say you're too thin, you're too fat, you're too good looking, you're too ugly. But the cross says that you are a perfect person that I was willing to die for. No greater love has any man than he lays down his life for his friend. Now that's the kind of love Jesus has. And that's the kind of love all of us are to demand in every relationship that we have. Let's stand on our feet. I don't know if this made any sense or not. Or if it spoke to anybody or not. If not, well, there's always next week. I hope some of you walk away from here today refusing to be treated as a second-class citizen. I hope some of you walk out of here today reminding yourself of who you are. You are loved by God Himself. And if some old boy don't appreciate your value, appreciate your worth because of the size that your clothes says you wear or because of the size of your bank account or the lack thereof, you don't need them to begin with. Find people in your life put around you that will value your worth. Because God values your worth. What did Jeremiah say before he formed me in my mother's womb? He knew me. Before he formed you in your mother's womb, he knew you and had a plan and has a plan for you. If you'll trust him. Let's start loving each other like 1 Corinthians teaches us to. Father, speak to our hearts in this room this morning. If we're honest, Father, all of us have fallen short on this love thing. All of us, if we had a book that was open and told all of our stories, many of us, including this preacher, would be embarrassed of the things I've done and said to my wife. If it were all true, that's all of us. We've had bad, bad days and bad episodes and bad times. But Father, all we can do is repent of them and then try our best to live for you, to be who you called us to be. For our young people, Couples out here are single people. For everybody in the room, remind us that we are greatly loved by God the Creator. No matter what size we are, no matter what size clothes we wear, no matter how tall, short, thin, fat, whatever it is, you created us with a purpose, for a purpose, and on purpose. Quit letting the world dictate to us what's beautiful. Because we're all beautiful because we're creatures of God himself. Let us leave here today not accepting any less than love and respect that we deserve. Let us leave here determined to love our husband or love our wives with everything we've got. Determined to love our boyfriend our girlfriend with everything we've got because tomorrow is not guaranteed. So Father, speak to our hearts today. Help us to look in the mirror and remind us that whatever the world says about us, that we are okay. Whether they think we are or not, we're okay. Because you created us and you loved us and you died for us. Father, speak to our hearts this morning. If anybody in the room today needs to be saved, rededicate their life, maybe they need to join the church, Lord, just give them the courage to step out on this pew over here to my left and just sit there and I'll meet them, Father, and talk with them about salvation in Jesus. We need to come today and pray. We need to pray for our, our young people that are going through struggles. We need to pray for our young couples or for ourselves as well. Whatever it might be, Father, the altar's open. Let us come. Father, speak to our hearts. Let us hear your voice this morning. 
and let us hear yours alone. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.